So many years ago now, when I was uh, just becoming a pastor, some wise person gave me some great advice and counsel. They said, uh, when people come to meet with you, pay very close attention to the last thing they say. Because the last thing is often what's most important. And uh, after 21 years of pastoral ministry, I found that to be quite true. I can't tell you uh, how often this has happened to me, that someone will make an appointment to come and talk with me, and we'll sit in my office and chat for an hour or so about this and that, and, and uh, it's all fine. But after a while, I start thinking to myself, you know, is this really what you wanted to talk to me about? I mean, it's not not bad or inappropriate or anything. It, it just doesn't seem like something that would rise to the level of going out of your way to call your pastor and set up an appointment to discuss it. And then they get up and they say goodbye to me and they walk to the door and they say one last thing, often kind of under their breath and just very nonchalantly, but it's very obvious to me that that's why they came to see me. That's the thing that's really on their heart. And so I say, whoa, wait a minute, sit back down. I want to talk about that. <laughs> you always have to be very careful to pay attention to the last thing people say. And uh, that's good wisdom for us to remember today as uh, we're reading the last thing that the Apostle Paul had to say to the church in Rome. All summer long, we've been on this journey through the book of Romans, and uh, he's talked about all kinds of things with us. Paul's talked to us about the gospel and about how we get to eternal life. And he's talked about suffering and about the people of Israel. He's, he's talked about serving and about how we relate to the government. Uh, he's talked about predestination and evangelism and the natural knowledge of God and so much more. But now we've come to the end of the book. Romans 15 and 16 is the last thing he has to say to us. And if that little nugget of wisdom I learned many years ago is true, then we better listen carefully because it may very well be that this is what's most on his heart. The most important thing he has to say. The most important thing we have to learn. And what is that? The answer is the lesson of unity. That we are in this thing called life together. Romans 15 verses 5 and 6 says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourself as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then as if he's afraid we're going to miss it, he makes the same point again in chapter 16, only this time in the negative. Uh, Romans 16 verse 17 says, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. What was most important to the Apostle Paul? It was that the church of Jesus Christ lives with a spirit of unity. A realization that we are in this together. An understanding that if you belong to Jesus, you belong to everyone else who belongs to Jesus. You know, I've seen all kinds of reminders of this uh, this weekend, both big and small. I've seen it on a very uh, basic level as scores of our people have been working together to run our street fair booth downtown. Now, whether it's uh, preparing and cooking the meat or working together to run the kitchen or the booth, uh, there's a real spirit of unity there. And there's an understanding that we're in this big job together. It's been great fun. I've seen it also on a much more significant level as I've watched the church all over our nation respond uh, to the current crisis on the Texas coast. 
Here at uh, St. Paul's, we've chosen to adopt uh, a Lutheran church in school in southwest Houston that we know well and uh, express our unity with them. And I'm going to tell you more about that in just a few minutes and how you can be a part of that. But I hope you've seen this. It's been great for me to see the church all over rise up and express our unity with our Texas brothers and sisters in Christ. To tell them we're in this together. I've also seen it on a very uh, personal level this week. This is a picture of some dear friends of ours uh, in Michigan. And uh, on Thursday night, as my wife and I were going to bed, I, I took one last look at my phone before going to sleep and discovered that uh, my friend's very dear friend from childhood uh, was in crisis in Michigan. Her daughter, Stephanie, on the right there, came home from school and found her mom collapsed on the floor uh, with no heartbeat. And they were able to revive Kathy, and uh, she is still in intensive care, and uh, as of right now, her life is hanging in the balance. And we are waiting and praying to God fervently that he will provide miraculous healing for her. But as soon as we found out, in the middle of the night, my, my wife said, I've got to be there. And, and I agreed. And so I bought her a plane ticket, and 12 hours later, Linda was on her way to Michigan, where she is now uh, at her friend's bedside. And why did Linda do that? Obviously, part of it is she loves her friend, and she wants to be there with her. But part of it, of course, is she wants her friend's husband and their four children to know that they're not alone. Right? That we're in this together with them. I was thinking about this, all of these things, both big things and small things, express this spirit of unity that Paul is pleading with us to understand. But here's the question, why does Paul feel so strongly about this? Why of all the things that Paul could choose to talk about in his final words to us, why does a spirit of unity rise to the top of the list? Why is this particular thing so important. And I think the only reason it's so important to Paul is because it was so important to Jesus. John 17 records for us what is often referred to as the high priestly prayer of Christ. And it's the prayer that Jesus prayed right before he was arrested and taken to the cross for us. And so in a sense, it's Jesus' last words. And what was most important to Jesus at this critical time? As Jesus had one last opportunity to pray and express his heart before his passion would take place, what was he thinking about? What did he want us to know? And the answer is the same as Paul's answer. He wanted us to live with the spirit of unity. In these final moments, Jesus first prayed for himself, and then he prayed for his original 12 disciples, and then it says he prayed this. My prayer is not for them alone, not just for the 12. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That all of them may be one. You see, Paul didn't just pull this idea out of nowhere. <laughs> this spirit of unity idea came directly from the Lord himself. And so then you got to ask, well, why did Jesus care so much about this? And he goes on and he tells us, he says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. In other words, the reason it matters that we live together with the spirit of unity is because unity is a reflection of the very character of God. 
There is no division in the Trinity. There is no competition in the Trinity. There is no selfishness in the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. They are in this together. And when we live and work together with a spirit of unity, what we're doing is reflecting that divine character to a world that so desperately needs to see it and experience it. But of course, that's exactly the problem. That's what we should do. But on, unlike the Trinity, a spirit of unity is not our default mode. It's what we should do. But it's not what we do do. And do do is a good word for what we do do. Theologians often use a Latin phrase to describe what we do do, what comes naturally to us. The phrase is this, incurvatus in se, means simply curved in on yourself. You understand that's your natural sinful default mode and mine too. And it's a great definition of what sin actually is at its core. This is basically what every sin boils down to. You are curved in on yourself. You know, forget what God wants, forget what others need, forget this unity uh, stuff, whether it's unity with God or unity with others, forget all that. Here's what I want. Here's what I need. But God is never like that. Never. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have never been curved in on themselves. And they never will be. Take a look at these verses and I'll show you. In Matthew 26, verse 39, Jesus, you will remember, prays to the Father in the garden. He says, not my will, but yours be done. In other words, Jesus says, my life isn't about what I want. It's about what you want, Father. But amazingly, in Matthew 17, verse 5, at the transfiguration, the Father does the same thing. This is my Son, he says. Listen to Him. The Father doesn't point people to Himself either. He points people to Jesus. And you find out the Spirit does the same thing. In John 14, 26, He points people not to Himself, but to Jesus. Jesus says there about the Holy Spirit, He, the Spirit, uh, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. The members of the Trinity are not curved in on themselves. They are curved out toward each other, and collectively they are all turned out toward the world. And so Jesus continues his famous prayer in John 17. He says, May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus Christ took on human flesh and became a man and bore our sins at the cross to save us. But the reason, the reason that all of that happened is because the Trinity was turned out, not in. God saw our desperate need and God was moved to do something about it because that's just who God is. This is God's amazing nature. God is always and only turned out, never in. And when we, by the Spirit's power, begin to turn ourselves out instead of in, Jesus says the world can begin to know that the Father sent Him, and they can experience His love for themselves. I learned this in such a powerful way when I was a young pastor. At the very first church I served uh, here in Southern California, we had a wonderful woman uh, named Barbara. And she was a very faithful uh, Christian woman, and she was 
very happily married, but her husband was not a believer. And when I say that, I don't just mean he was not a church attender. He was actually highly committed to another organization uh, that was basically a cult. In fact, he was so involved in it, he was essentially the equivalent there of what we would call clergy. He was a leader of the cult. And Barbara just loved her husband, and so she was always, as you can imagine, so concerned about him and his salvation. And then one night, I got a phone call over dinner that Barbara's husband had basically dropped dead. And it was very sudden and very unexpected, and so I raced out the door to go to Barbara's house to be with her. And the whole way over, I was thinking and praying like crazy about what in the world am I going to say to her? I was 26 years old at the time. I was brand new to this pastor gig, and, and this was a very, very difficult situation. I kept thinking, what class did they cover this in at seminary? I mean, what, what comfort could I possibly give her, especially when her husband was so overtly and adamantly opposed to the Christian faith? And so I went and I did the best I could, which truthfully was not very good. And I'm really not just saying that to try to be humble today. It truly was not very good at all. I fumbled my way through a few prayers and some moments of conversation that were quite awkward and just sat with her mostly. And I remember I felt so inadequate in that moment. And a few days later, I went with her to the mortuary to help her make arrangements for her husband because I knew she was just struggling so much she'd never be able to do it by herself. And after we did that, when we were walking out to our cars, Barbara turned to me and she said the most amazing thing, something I've never forgotten. She said, Pastor, thank you so much. You've been so helpful. Now that may not seem all that amazing to you, but it absolutely was, and I knew it, because I knew when she said it that it was not true. <laughs> I did not know what to do or to say, and I'm quite certain that hardly anything I said or did was particularly helpful. And it bothered me. I thought about this for a long time afterward. I mean, I was polite in the moment, and so, oh, you're welcome, but it truly bothered me, and I kept thinking, why would she say something like that when it was so obviously not true? And you know what I finally realized? I finally realized she said that not just because she was being nice, not because of anything in particular I had said or done. She said that simply because I was there. And even though nothing I had said or done was particularly helpful in and of itself, to have her pastor there in the middle of this crisis was a reminder to her of something far more important. That God was with her. And that He would never leave her or forsake her. It's exactly what Jesus said would happen. Simply by my presence, simply by demonstrating a spirit of unity that we were in this awful mess together, Barbara remembered that the Father had sent Jesus for her. And that he loved her like he loved Jesus. And that made a tremendous difference to her. And that is the power of the body of Christ when it acts with the spirit of unity. I share this today because I suspect that most of you sitting here today 
would feel very inadequate also if you were in a situation like that. And yet you are able to do far more than you realize. Not because of you, but because of the one who lives in you and works through you. So let this be our final word for today, the one that we do not forget. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourself as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in.